Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber. And today our special guest is Todd White, the founder of Dry Farm Wines, who will once again be sponsoring our event in February. Dry Farm Wines has been a fantastic sponsor for many years, and today we get to speak with the founder and talk about wine. So how's it going today, Todd? Awesome. Thanks for having me. I have a lot to tell you about wine, including one of my favorite topics, which is what I call Wine Truth 101, the dirty, dark secrets of the wine business. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to getting into it, Todd. Let me tell the audience a little bit more about you. So Todd White is an entrepreneur and launched Dry Farm Wines in 2015. It has now become one of the world's premier natural wine merchants. Todd's always had a passion for wine, but in 2015 became fanatical about what he put in his body. He wanted to increase his longevity, improve his quality of life, have better memory, better sleep, and elevated performance. Through his journey, he discovered low-carb keto and intermittent fasting and wondered how alcohol and wine consumption would fit in fit into his new lifestyle. Initially focused on sugar content, friends suggested sugar-free organic natural wine selections from Europe. And for Todd, this was the turning point to develop dry farm wines. From dry farming to a careful vetting process for each grower and each wine, laboratory testing and independent cert certification from the enologist, every bottle is farmed organically, grown without irrigation and fermented with wild non-GMO native yeast. There's much more and I want you to hear from Todd himself. So Todd, if you can provide some more background and tell us about your personal and professional interests and how you choose your grown and curated styles of natural low carb wines. Thank you, I appreciate that introduction. It sounds <clears throat> somewhat esteemed. Uh, but anyhow, so my journey was, but. I started biohacking or focused on optimizing the life experience and the human experience in my 40s. I'm now 62. And I wanted to, my goal was to expand my health span. So we're basically, all of us will die from a handful of the same diseases. The question is, when is the onset of those diseases? And for me, I wanted to delay the onset of disease as long as possible and expand my health and make my health span longer. Um, so, you know, in my forties, <clears throat> in my forties, I started focusing on arriving at a healthy 60. And so now my focus is at arriving at a healthy 90. And part of that was experimenting with what I now call modified ketogenic diet, which was really the Atkins program. So I started low carb experimentations back in the 1980s. And then in 2014 or 15, I became very fanatical and started experiencing, I call it fanatic, the other people probably thought I was a fanatic too, started experimenting with a therapeutic ketogenic diet, not for therapeutic reasons, but just sort of went over the edge, was doing daily blood testing and, you know, sort of, you know, a bunch of my friends were like post on social media how high their, you know, their millimolar of, of uh, beta hydroxybutyrate got, and, you know, using a ketone meter and um, so on and so forth. So I, for a couple of years, I was on a therapeutic ketogenic diet, which is very high in fat. It's not really sustainable for most people. Most people don't even last as long as I did, but I went for a couple of years. During that period, I don't know if it was related to aging or if it was related to my experimentation with the diet, but I noticed that I wasn't functioning well, I wasn't feeling well from drinking. I only drink wine. And so <clears throat> I quit drinking for a while, a period I refer to as suffering through sobriety. See, I mean, I love wine. I like drinking wine. I love the community of wine. Um, I'm a bit of a hedonist, which is why I'm a biohacker, is because I want to feel great all the time. I mean, there was an article in the New York Times recently that associated drinking with exercise, and there was, there was this study, and they were showing that people who exercise regularly drink more, and they couldn't figure out why, and it was quite simple for me to tell you why people who exercise also drink, because they love feeling good. Right, And so when you drink pure natural wine, 
in moderate amounts, you feel better than not drinking. Generally speaking, you also feel better when you exercise for a whole variety of different reasons. But this, I, I, I stopped drinking and I really missed wine. Then I started drinking wine again, but I was mixing it with tea. It was in the winter time because I wanted to, I thought it was just the alcohol. Because sometimes people report when they go on a ketogenic diet that that their their body is less tolerant of alcohol. It's there's no scientific tie to it. It's just an anecdotally people report this. So I thought, you know what? I need to drink less alcohol. And so <clears throat> I didn't have any idea about what I'm about to share with you about what we call the dirty dark secrets of the wine business. I didn't know anything about those yet. I just thought I needed to drink less wine. Now, being in the wine business and being the wine guy, and I do a lot of these podcasts, and this is what I'm about to tell you next surprises most people the most. And that is, I believe that alcohol is a dangerous neurotoxin. And if you don't drink today, you probably shouldn't start drinking. And some people shouldn't drink at all. But for people like me who enjoy wine and love wine and drink in spite of the fact that it's toxic uh, because I love it and it's part of the joy of my life and if that's you and you care about what you put in your body then you should care about what we call conscious consumption meaning you should care about what's in your wine because see there's a whole lot of other stuff in wine other than just fermented grape juice and GMO yeast so now, everything I'm going to share with you is so shocking and surprising that I, I want to inform you that you can go to the internet and search any of these topics or go to our website and get links to cited accredited health authorities, including the government and non-government accredited agencies like the World Health Organization or the National Institute of Health, which is a U.S. government uh, database that everything I'm going to tell you is verifiable with the Google search. So it sounds, it's going to be so surprising and shocking, you'll think like, wow, this, this guy is a really good salesman, he's just telling me a bunch of bunk. But actually, everything I'm telling you can be verified with a Google search, but it's so surprising and shocking to most people, it's hard to believe. So when I thought it was just alcohol, see, alcohol levels have been rising in U.S. wine for decades. And now they average nearly a 15%. So I wanted to go in search of lower alcohol wine. So I asked this friend of mine who was the smartest person I know in the wine business. <clears throat> At the time I was living in Napa Valley. And I said, what's the lowest alcohol? I was going to think about making wine at that point. I said, what's the lowest I can make alcohol in wine and have it still taste like wine? Because once you remove a certain level of alcohol, it no longer tastes like wine anymore. It starts to taste like a fermented beverage. It's not uh, more like a hard kombucha or something. So I, um, but I really had a love affair with wine. And so he said, you know, have you drank any of the lower alcohol wines in Europe? And I was like, no, I haven't. So this started my search. And uh, it was a kind of a long journey. I wasn't thinking about it as a business. Dry Farm Wines became an accidental business. I was just trying to figure out a way to drink healthier for myself, right? To be able to still enjoy wine and feel good. So I went to the, this famous wine store in San Francisco and I went in and I said to, this is a very large, very, you know, sort of storied wine store in Northern California. The, you know, Northern California is the most important wine appellation in North America. So I go into this wine store and I go to the counter and ask the guy, hey, can you help me find lower alcohol wines in the store? And he looked at me like I had three eyes. And I was like, like, uh, no, we can't help you at all, but you can look on the bottle. Well, this is my first journey into finding low alcohol wines and actually it became a part of my discovery of the collusion between the u.s government and the wine industry 
And let's start with wine stated on a wine bottle. I say stated because by law, it's not even required to be accurate. So if wine printed on a wine label says 14%, under the law, it could be as high as 15.5% and still be legal. Now, why would wine companies misstate the amount of alcohol in their, in their wine? Well, it's for two reasons. One, they want to state a lower alcohol amount for people who care about it or think that it's healthy to drink less alcohol. And number two, and more importantly, the amount of tax that they pay. They pay a federal tax. The higher the alcohol stated on the bottle, the higher the tax. So there was a really a quite legitimate reason for why this law was written in the 1940s. See, most of alcohol legislation is super old, written post-prohibition. Post, post and the reason that that existed at that time was because <clears throat> at that time, the alcohol testing labs, there could be variants from lab to lab, right? Because the testing equipment wasn't very sophisticated. Today, that's not true. Today, lab testing is very sophisticated. Lab after lab will test the same. But the wine industry doesn't want it changed. That's just the very minor edge of the collusion between the government and the wine industry. Now, the big secret, the one they, they have been successfully been able to hide until I came along, <clears throat> are the additives in wine. Again, everything I'm going to tell you is easily verifiable by, wine, by a Google search. I'm going to tell you how these additives, they're also on our website at dryfarmwines.com. So all links to all of these government documents. We tell a very straightforward and elegant story that you can, and we'll actually, we'll send you links you can put in your, your show notes. There's 76 additives approved by, by the Trade and Tax Bureau, uh, which see alcohol and its labeling and its health messages and these additives are not regulated by the FDA as they are in food. They're regulated by a taxing authority. So they don't even have FDA approval. These additives are approved by a taxing authority, not by a health or drug authority. So, which we think is really kind of interesting because the TTB's job is to sell more alcohol, right? And gather more tax, not to make you think um, about your health. And the wine industry is not trying to make wines better or healthier. They're trying to make them cheaper and faster. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. But these 76 additives, these 76 many toxic additives are used in winemaking to make it cheaper and faster and easier. Not to mention the industrial farming. Only 5% of U.S. vineyards are organically farmed. It might also be worth noting that grapes are actually number six in the dirty dozen list of fruits and vegetables that contain the highest amount of toxins like glyphosate, which is the most widely applied herbicide in U.S. vineyards. So grapes are number six in the dirty dozen. That just relates to farming. Now on the additive side, I know this is a tremendous amount of information, and some of it can be quite confusing. But on the additive side, you've got the 76 TTB approved additives. Well, let me tell you a little bit about these additives. Two of them are acute toxins. <clears throat> now, acute toxin has a very specific clinical definition. And the clinical definition of an acute toxin is that it's a substance that with one dose or multiple doses over a 24-hour period will cause severe health consequences or even death. That is the clinical definition of an acute toxin. So these additives, and the most dangerous one, is, dangerous one is called dimethyl dicarbonate. And if you go to the link, which I'm going to send you to these additives, you'll see dimethyl dicarbonate is used to sterilize wine. Uh, it's highly toxic. It's, it's used to treat the single most common bacterial fault in wine, known as Bretomyces. 
So if you get Brettanomyces, known as Brett in your wine, this chemical will correct it by sterilizing the wine and killing this bacteria. Of the 76 additives, two are acute toxins. 12 are considered health hazards by the National Institute of Health. Three, eight, eight of these additives contain mycotoxins, including ochratoxin A, which is a known carcinogenic found from mold. Now, in the EU, in the European Union, and across Europe, wines are required by law to be lab tested for ochratoxin A and other mycotoxins. In the United States, they are not required to be tested, and they are not. Uh, two of these additives are considered by the NIH, the National Institute of Health, to be corrosive. That's kind of like drain cleaner, right? The six of these additives are made from animal organs, including pig pancreas and cow stomach. So this is a pretty alarming group of compounds and substances. Some of them are natural, by the way. So they're not all toxic. They're not all as offensive as the ones I just described to you. But <clears throat> the problem is, is there's this total lack of transparency fueled by Washington money in that wine is the largest, most consumed product in the world that does not have a contents label on it or nutritional information. Now, this is not an accident. You probably already know that in Washington, money is exchanged for power and influence. And so the wine industry spent millions of dollars in lobby money on K Street with these very powerful lobbyists to keep contents labeling and nutritional information off of a bottle of wine. Now, personally, anything I consume, the first thing I do is look, see how much sugar is contained in it. Because I think sugar is really kind of an ugly thing. And so I don't want to be drinking it in my wine. But the fact that there's no nutritional information on a bottle of wine, you have no idea how much sugar is in it. And that can range widely in the amount of sugar that can be contained in a bottle of wine. Well, these 76 additives and the nastiness of them that I just described to you is why there's not a contents, a label ingredient, a, an ingredients label on a wine bottle because the wine industry has fought vigorously to keep them off of wine bottles because they don't want you to see what's actually in the wine. Now, the wines we sell, we'll talk about that in a moment, and the wines I drink are additive free. They're also lower in alcohol. They're also sugar free. The only way to know if a wine is sugar-free is to lab test it, right? You can't always taste smaller amounts of sugar in wine because of its acid level. But we'll get to talking about those wines in a moment. Let's stay focused on the conventional wines when, and, and how this is, why this is happening. So, and, and, and why you don't know about it. So, 19 years ago, there's an interesting development recently. 19 years ago, a nonprofit who's responsible for much of, much of the good work that has become nutritional and sugar labeling and disclosures on foods, it's a very successful nonprofit in Washington called the Center for Science in Public Interest. So 19 years ago, this institute filed a petition with the TTB they're the regulating agency over the labeling of alcohol, federal agency. They're the ones who've approved the additives. 19 years ago, the Center for Science and Public Interest filed a 16-page petition with the Treasury Department and the TTB. That's the Treasury Department oversees the TTB because they're a taxing agency, not a health authority, right? Not that I have a lot of confidence in the FDA, but let's just say that they're more informed than the TTB. So, now, sorry to take you down this wormhole, but it's really important to understand how, how, this, how, and how, how this is happening and what we're doing about it. 
So this 16 page petition sat dormant for 19 years in a desk drawer somewhere in Washington, crushed by industry influence until two weeks ago, the CSPI filed a lawsuit against the Treasury Department over it. So now, meanwhile, these lawsuits, <clears throat> we support this lawsuit, we support the petition, and we think labeling should be transparent on every alcohol product, and particularly on wine. See, so wine's carved out into this very specific area of protection. Beer or any alcoholic product under 7% is regulated by the FDA. Wine falls in this really special carve out just for wine, which is why this information is so important that people, people know about it, because it's just all hidden. So the CSPI filed a lawsuit against the Treasury Department two weeks ago. Now, we support the lawsuit and we support the petition. Um, it's not likely to change anything. These lawsuits go on for decades, right? It's not likely to change anything, but it is poignant. And the Wall Street Journal and other prominent news agencies covered this lawsuit. And we're continuing to generate even more uh, discussion about it because we think people should know that this is wrong. And we don't agree with it. And we don't think you should be drinking those things. And if you decide to drink them, you should have the option to make that choice. If you want to drink dimethyl dicarbonate, you should know that you're drinking it. Uh, not everybody will choose not to drink it. I would choose not to drink it, and people in our health community would choose not to drink it, as they do now by consuming our wines. Now, how did this all happen? And then we're going to get, then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about natural wines and the wines that we promote, sell, and consume. I like right. to say, I, yeah. Yeah, let me let me just back up. So, w w did the CSPI petition uh, labeling and sugar content in wine? Yes. Contents label, ingredients, treatments, and nutritional information, including sugar. So, a, a full nutritional panel, just like you see on a, any other food. I mean, their big driver, actually, a big part of their work. A massive part of their work is really been around sugar disclosures. They're the ones who got the, the, the thing they're working on right now that is I mean, like not likely to pass, but one of the things that they're working on now is to get food labeling on the front of the package instead of hidden on the back. They're also the agent, they're also the nonprofit that got um, the added sugars category added to the to nutritional label. So now if it has added sugar, it has to disclose how much sugar was added. Yeah. Right. So well, that's, they're the nonprofit that's responsible for that. Yeah. So in the low carb community, we've certainly heard from the CSPI and, and I agree that their initiative has been to, uh, to lower uh, sugar content in our diet. But we've kind of gone back and forth because they, they've promoted trans fats or they, and, and, and then they they eventually said, well, trans fats are bad, and they were promoting uh, low fat diets. But uh, there, there's no question that they're like much of. Uh, look, I had the same discussion with them. I called them. Our foundation was considering making a gift. They wouldn't take our money because they felt that it would appear as a conflict of interest because we're in the wine business and they're suing over this labeling. But we're like, we're in agreement with you. You know, they're like, we've never had an alcohol company ever contact us and want to give us money. So I, I did research on them. I had some of the same issues. Let me just give you a quick, just in fairness to them statement. Um, like a lot of people, um, they made some errors along the way as bad information was being promoted by different agencies and Alan Key's work in, in, in fats and you know, the, the, the Department of Agriculture, whose job it is to sell grains, is actually in charge of, you know, my plate or what used to be the food pyramid. I mean, there's been, there's been tremendous misinformation where nutrition has been concerned, and they've been a part of some of that. Uh, so I have kind of a mixed 
I have mixed feelings about them, but when I ask them about it, they're like, look, we've made some mistakes. And in fairness, we'll tell you that our founder, who's no longer alive, our founder was, had some very strong opinions, right? Our founder was a, um, who's no longer involved with the organization, was a bit of a zealot, right? As people who do this kind of work oftentimes are, they have very strong opinions. So we don't agree with them on everything, but we think they are doing some good work in some key categories. And I agree. And I think the world is better off for them today than perhaps without them. So, but in the fat, you know, the fat thing has been the most misunderstood part of this whole nutritional disservice that not only the government has engaged in, but uh, special interest and food companies. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just the, the fat thing, the fat, it, it still hasn't been changed. You know, to, sure. to, to tell us that it's unhealthy to eat avocado or salmon because the fat content is just bizarre. Meanwhile, we'll promote Cheerios, right? <laughs> And so it's, it's worth noting, we'll come off of this because I've got a few more things to tell you about wine, but, you know, it's worth noting that my plate, the former food pyramid, again, was managed, is managed by the Department of Agriculture. And the Department of Agriculture's primary job is to sell grains, the thing I think is one of the most unhealthy parts of our, talk about glyphosate and GMO wheat, blah, 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 you know, all the same thing, like... I don't need any of it, but you know, that's a part of my wellness journey. I don't, I don't promote consuming it. You know, I think people should eat a very low carb, low glycemic. Um, I mean, I wear, I'm about to install one today. I meant to put it on this morning. I wear a continuous glucose monitor about four times a year for 14 days because I believe this relationship between blood glucose and the hyperproduction of insulin is the cause of most of our chronic disease. And I like to experiment with different carbohydrates and food stacking. And, you know, I, I do intermittent fasting and I like to monitor my blood glucose through these experiments. That makes me a little bit fanatical, but, you know, this is kind of my interest. Well, sure, Todd, we couldn't agree with you more about uh, your views on nutrition. And that's the whole purpose of uh, uh, my goal from the from the healthcare standpoint to to uh, assist in assist, uh, uh, advancing nutrition science, and I didn't mean to distract you from uh, the ongoing conversation about uh, the wine production, and I'd like to bring you back to that and let's hear uh, where you were headed with it. Yeah, so I think it's important. The reason I, I love going down this you know discussion of other modalities that I practice, like intermittent fasting or my diet or you know, my fitness protocol, or it, it's really important for people to understand when that, that I walk the walk. This is not, this is not a sales pitch. I'm not even in this wine business because I was trying to find a business to be in. I got in it because I believed in the product and I believed in sharing this education with people. And it's important for people to know that you know, we're more than, we really view ourselves as a health food company that sells wine. We're advocates. We are vocal advocates, or we sometimes say evangelist for nutritional education across all categories, not just wine. But let me get back to the wine thing for a second and cover two things. First of all, how did this happen? It happened because the wine industry got really big and really consolidated in the last 25 or 30 years. And so, and got really powerful and very wealthy. So here's how that happened. Today, the top three wine companies in the United States make nearly 60% of all the wine. And the top 25 wine companies in the United States make 90% of all U.S. wines. So when you go in the grocery store and you see shelves and shelves of wine, most of that wine is made by just a handful of companies. Now, they want you to believe that it's made in a little farmhouse, right? So they put a farmhouse on the label or a chateau or, you know, they get some rating from somebody you think who knows something about wine and they say, oh, this is 90 points, this would be a great wine. 
all of those, see these multi-billion dollar marketing conglomerates, these manufacturers who make this engineered beverage, it's made by chemists, not by farmers, in massive wine factories in Central California. They hide behind, these handful of companies hide behind thousands of brands and labels. So they're not just all ABC wine, right? They're, they'll have two or 300 wines or 500 SKUs, right? All with different names, all made in the same factories. So, <clears throat> you know, I don't eat food made in factories and I'm not gonna drink wine made in factories either. I don't drink anything made in a factory. And so, you know, I drink Origin coffee or hand harvested teas or water, you know, if that's spring fed, I don't drink anything that's made in a factory. Um, I, don't, I don't want to drink wine made in a factory. So these very powerful companies, you know, are out there again, not trying to make wine better or healthier. They're trying to make it cheaper and faster at scale. One thing we do really well in America is scale things, right? And so everything gets really big. Right, and so fueled with cheap Wall Street money, you know, public companies have consolidated or what's known in the private equity business is a roll up. They've rolled up the industry into some really giant companies and gone out and bought a whole bunch of brands uh, from household names you trust. Like, let's use probably the most famous one in Napa Valley, it's Robert Mondavi. So Mondavi Wine Company in 2004 was acquired by one of these huge conglomerates. Right, and so even brands that you think you know and trust are oftentimes owned by companies you don't know anything about, making wine in factories in ways you don't know anything about, putting additives in that you don't know anything about, and no way for you to have this knowledge. So what we did when I discovered all this is like, I set out and created the strictest, most comprehensive certification in the wine business, known as the Dry Farm Wine Certification. So if it has our seal of certification on the bottle, it's going to meet a number of criteria. Number one, it's going to be natural wine. What is a natural wine? Natural is a confusing term because on food products, it's a misleading term because on food products, they use it as a way to suggest that they're sustainable or organic when they're not. But in the natural wine world, Dry Farm Wines is the only natural wine certification in the world. Now, France is going to certify natural wines next year. They'll be the first country to certify wines as natural. But Dry Farm Wines certification, because we're really health enthusiasts, goes beyond just being natural. So let me tell you what a natural wine is, and there's a universal global understanding of what natural wine means. Number one, it's always organic or biodynamically farmed. And biodynamic farming is a prescriptive form of organic farming. Number two, natural wines always fermented with wild indigenous native yeast. Now, what does that mean? Well, on the skin of every grape berry in the world at the time of harvest, there's a white waxy film on the grape. That is yeast. That yeast was collected naturally in the vineyard through the air. Natural winemakers only use that yeast for their fermentation. Conventional winemakers in these factories do not use it. They instead use a GMO lab cultured yeast. Now, why do they do that? Because these native wild yeast are very temperamental and they're fragile. And you can't make wine in very large quantities using this wild native yeast. It's too unstable, it requires too much coddling. So instead, they use this GMO lab cultured yeast to ferment. Number three, natural wines are additive free. So they don't contain any of these toxic chemicals that we've discussed or animal organs as we've discussed. So that's what makes a natural wine. Now dry farm wines, the baseline is that it has to be a natural wine. And then our certification takes it several levels higher. A, lower alcohol. So we don't sell anything over 12.5%. We sell wines between 7% and 12.5%. I've always described to you, I think that alcohol is a 
is a neurotoxin that's dangerous and you should consume less of it. But I don't want to stop drinking wine. So the only way for me to consume less alcohol without stopping drinking or drinking less is just to drink a lower alcohol in the wine. I actually prefer the way it tastes as well because alcohol is not friendly with food. You don't sit down with the salad with vodka, right? Alcohol is not food friendly. So actually to make food, wine more food friendly and to make it a better pair, we actually, you're just increasing the water content. There's basically only three things in wine, in natural wine. Ethyl alcohol, polyphenols, and water. So if it's 10% alcohol is what I usually drink, 10 or 11%, it's 90% water, right? Now then it doesn't get there by adding water. It's, 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 it's a fermentation process that gets it to lower alcohol. So it's 12 and a half or below. It's also dry farmed. The name of our company is Dry Farm Wines. What that means is it's grown without irrigation. And of the 800 farms that we work with around the world, we don't sell any domestic wines, by the way. There are no wines made in the United States that meet all of our criteria. So as you'll notice, all the wines we bring to you are from Europe, South America, and South Africa. There are no US wines that meet our criteria. So, and people often say, oh gosh, when I go to Europe and I drink wine there, I feel so much better, right? And so, now that's not to suggest that all European wines are, are are natural or that they're not additive free. That, that's, that's not a universal statement, but back to the dry farm wine certification. Dry farm, own the 800 farm family, small family farms that we work with around the world, most in Europe, not using irrigation, just on the farms we work with, saves 1.4 billion gallons of water a year. And so water is not necessary to cultivate a grapevine anywhere. Grapes have been dry farmed for most of the 9,000 years that we've been making wine. So humans have been consuming wine for about 9,000 years. For most of that period, all of that was unirrigated. In the US today, less than 1% of vineyards are un unirrigated. Now, why do you irrigate a grapevine? Because it grows it faster, cheaper, and bigger, and it weighs more. And since fruit is sold by the weight, then um, if it has a bigger berry full of water, it's worth more. Then sugar-free, we don't allow any sugar in our wines. Um, then additive-free and lower naturally occurring sulfites. So any, this is, sulfites are probably the most confusing, there are two things I think are confusing to people about wine I hear getting the most questions of. How is your wine sugar free? I'll tell you that in a moment. And then, you know, what about sulfites? Are they, I don't, they make me feel bad. For most people, sulfites are not generally contributing to their negative outcome until they get very high. And so the US legal limit is 350 parts per million of sulfur dioxide. Any fermented food and many foods contain sulfites, but anything that's fermented contains sulfite. So it's just that it was required to put on a bottle of wine. This is another story. I won't take you down the wormhole, but it was a political Washington, D.C. thing that made with sulfites. It got in the 1960s from a teetotaling senator in, in the Carolinas, in South Carolina. Um, but as I said, any fermented product will contain sulfite. Now, we have a limit on the amount of sulfite we will allow in a wine and that's 70 parts per million because that's, that's the outer edge of what could be in naturally occurring sulfites. But it's, it's fair to note that our average wine contains 39 parts per million, nearly 10 times less than what the government allows. And again, these are naturally occurring, so they're not, the wine hasn't been sterilized. Now, sulfur dioxide is used as a sterilizing agent so it kills everything in the wine, including, it's a preservative, it's used as a preservative, including the gut-friendly bacteria that Dr. David Perlmutter, who's one of the foremost experts on gut health, has published several times on the living bacteria in natural wines because they haven't been sterilized. So we take the natural wine as the, as the floor, and then we have some certification levels that 
you know, that are important to us, particularly, this, particularly to the sugar and the alcohol. And so that's, and so people ask, well, how's your wine sugar free? Well, when any wine can be sugar free if it's fully fermented, meaning the winemaker as a matter of choice allows the yeast to eat all of the available sugar. That's how you ferment wine. But what's happening in vegetable wines is a little device that goes in the side of the tank in the wine that at any given time will tell the winemaker how much sugar is left in the wine. And when, when he or she reaches the desired amount of sugar that they want to leave behind, known as residual sugar, or RS in the industry, when they determine the amount of residual sugar they want to leave behind, they break the fermentation. They use sulfur dioxide to kill the yeast. So that's how sugar is not added to wine. Sugar gets in wine by breaking the fermentation early, leaving unfermented sugars behind, known as residual sugar. So anyway, that's that's sort of, gosh, the wine truth 101 that tells you a little bit. Uh, be happy in wrapping up here to take any questions you have or any thoughts you might have. Yeah, well, gr great, Todd. That that was a fantastic uh, learning experience for me and and the audience. And uh, it, it seems unfortunate that uh, in in the U.S. none of the wine producers meet the criteria. And it kind of reminds me about food production. Our you know our source of food in the U.S. has has uh, hasn't kept up with Europe in terms of standards and it, it's even worse with wine production so you know it's companies such as yourself through your effort and clearly you ooze uh, the passion about uh, health and uh, that this is indeed uh, a product uh, addressing uh, health long term and I would also mention that uh, you know as I have improved my health over the years and I had lost 40 to 50 pounds some 20 plus years ago. Uh, I became a lightweight in term of, terms of alcohol consumption. And that is really uh, very common uh, among uh, individuals that lose weight and, and improve their health that uh, they can't tolerate alcohol. And you've really addressed everything with, with your product. And uh, I've enjoyed it over the years myself. Nice, nice. I appreciate that. We, you know, I always say we drink and sell, you know, these amazing wines because I drink the same wine you do every single day. I also, I also taste, I personally, I just tasted 30 wines last night. I taste every wine before it goes out. You know, even after it's been through all these rigorous, our taste panel, our lab test, our, you know, criteria, even after it's been vetted by a half a dozen other people um, through these processes, before it leaves our warehouse to go in the box to come to you, I personally taste it again, you know, to catch any wines that I don't think meet our exceptional taste profiles. Look, it can be healthy and it can be wonderful, but if it doesn't taste terrific, then that doesn't work for me because I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with taste. I love taste. I love the taste of everything, which is why I eat natural foods and why I eat organic and why I eat grass-fed beef and why I eat you know, because they taste better, right? And so not only are they better for you, but they, they have to taste better. If it doesn't taste better, it's kind of pointless. Well, well, great, Todd. I wonder if we'll ever get to meet you in person at one of our events. Well, let's try to come to your next event in February. How about that? Yeah, well, I, I understand you probably have a busy life and um, uh, we, we do appreciate uh, your group coming and, and supporting uh, our conference year after year. And uh, just real quick to finish up, how can uh, the audience find out about more and uh, your company? Well, we are on all social media, Dry uh, Farm Wines. And uh, so you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook. And we're, um, you can find links to all these things that I've discussed in a section on our website called The Founder's Story. And inside that section, you can find links to all of these government documents and things that I refer to, or you can find them online, or we'll also send you a link to all of the National Institute of Health sightings and the government additives list and so on. You can post, put, post in your show notes. But yeah, so we're just dryfromwines.com. Thank you for supporting us. And thanks for, you know, so many people, you know, 
there are hundreds of thousands of people who support our mission and care about what we're doing and who depend on us to curate the very best pure natural wines that are healthier for them. And uh, we're just really grateful to be able to make a living doing something we believe in and supporting families we believe in. Great, Todd. Well, to our audience, Dry Farm Wines will be at our conference in February, and uh, they have sampling throughout the conference. They even provide uh, wine at some of the other uh, activities, the dinner activities. And uh, of course, if you want to uh, find out about more, our con more about our conference, please visit lowcarbconferences.com, and we hope that you can uh, attend in February. So until next time, thanks, Todd, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you.